used to doing two things at once. Why not brush and floss at the same time? It's easy with Waterpik Sonic Fusion 2.0. The two-in-one oral care breakthrough with two times the bristle speed and superior flossing power. It cleans deep between teeth and below the gum line. Clinically proven to be up to twice as effective as regular brushing and flossing for removing plaque and improving gum health. So upgrade your oral care with the world's first flossing toothbrush. Go online or ask your dental professional about Waterpik Sonic Fusion. Can I just say, it feels so good to be able to go back yes. and watch movies yeah. in the theater again. Yes, and on Christmas Day, you can add American Underdog, the Kurt Warner story to your must-see. Yeah. Happening now. The Islamic community and neighbors are speaking out in the case of Lena Kill, the three-year-old that disappeared about 48 hours ago. And I'm Alicia Barrera, and coming up, we take you inside that apartment complex where Lena was last seen. Been pleasant over the last few days. Santa may be sweating for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. I'll have your forecast on what could potentially be our second warmest Christmas ever. And no, it's not just you. Groceries are indeed much more expensive. And coming up next, we're going to break down which items are costing you more now compared to a year ago. The news at five starts right now. At first at five, a breaking news update on the search for three-year-old Lena Keel. She's the little girl who disappeared from a Northwest Side apartment complex playground Monday night. She is still missing. Now, what we know is that today a $10,000 reward has been put out to help find her. It's being funded by the Islamic Center. Also, just about two minutes ago, Police Chief William McManus gave us a live update. Our Patty Santos joins us now live from Public Safety Headquarters with the latest. Now, Patty, uh, the police chief spoke for about 10 minutes or so. What's the latest? Well, the latest is that the search continues right now at the site where the child disappeared, where Lena Kill disappeared, and also here at the police headquarters. We want to show you some video of her and what the scene looks like out there right now. Uh, we know that uh, the FBI abduction team has been called in to help uh, the police department here. The police chief telling us they have resources that can speed up this process of trying to find out where she might be and if she was abducted. But at this point, they're making it very clear that they're treating this as a missing persons case. They do not yet have information that leads them to believe that she was abducted. They are also looking at many, many pieces of video evidence uh, as they continue the search. And you know they're just exhausting every possible thing out there. And while we might not see what's going on on the ground, they are still continuing to search here, those videos at police headquarters. They also had teams on on the ground, searching the woods, searching the areas in and around the apartment complex where she was last seen. This is near uh, Fredericksburg and Warsbach Road. Uh, but again, no good news tonight. She is still missing, uh, but the police chief thanking the community uh, that uh, has been helping with with reaching out to, to the neighbors there and to the neighborhoods to try and find her. We're going to continue this, uh, so bring you more updates and bring you more coming up tonight at 6. Patty, uh, stay with us for a second. I think we have a couple of sound bites from the police chief that we're going to roll right now of part of his news conference. Let's go to those right now. We are not treating this as an abduction right now. They can provide resources that we don't have to assist us in this search. We will continue making as much contact with the community as we can, trying to find someone who knows anything about Lena. I mentioned it yesterday that if anyone has any information at all, whether you think it may be helpful or not, let us make that determination. Patty, I, I have a question for you. You specifically asked the chief, what is the difference between an abduction and a missing persons? Uh, because he's, he was very clear that this is not an abduction case right now. What did he tell you about the difference? Well, right now he's telling us they don't have enough information to find out if there's a suspect, if she was in fact abducted. They're really looking for any clues that could give them something to start off on, uh, whether it's a vehicle, whether it's a person that made up Tate walked away with her. Um, they just don't know. So they cannot yet call this an abduction. They're simply treating it as a missing persons case. 
Patty reporting for us live from the scene. We really appreciate it. And we do know that the chief said moments ago that the search has not been expanded beyond San right. Antonio, which is usually a, a good sign. Hopefully it is. Uh, but of course, we'll continue to keep you updated on this. Now, we know that the community has really taken this very hard. The community there has been on edge, especially at the apartment complex where that little girl was last seen Monday. Yeah, Alicia Barrera takes us inside the Villas del Cabo apartments on Fredericksburg Road, where neighbors tell us they're now worried about the safety of their own children. The little girl that was here, she was playing right here when I came home from work. She was in a red dress. Santana Jackson is a mom of three and frequently saw her neighbor, Lena Kill, playing outside. This little girl plays with my three-year-old. I have a three-year-old daughter. But now it's an empty playground and an eerily quiet complex. Neighbors at Villa del Cabo are on edge after three-year-old Lena disappeared from this playground on Monday. It makes me not want to have my kids come outside. Her daughter Cora is too young to realize her friend Lena never came home or why police knocked on every door, including theirs. They wanted to come in, look inside the house, see if she was there, then FBI came, and then they check in everybody's trunk, you know. She says things have changed since she first moved to the apartment complex six months ago, and now she's ready to end her lease. It has been strange people around here that I haven't seen before. That's why the apartment put a, they put a curfew. There's a curfew, the kids are supposed to be in by seven. That mom, without a doubt, is so worried. She's asking parents to please keep a close eye on their child. We heard from Chief McManus earlier who says, surely no parent after hearing the story is leaving their child, especially at that age, without any supervision. Jackson also asked the apartment complex to put surveillance cameras up around the area, as right now there aren't any, perhaps some in the front. So again, that is what police is looking into now to see if anyone has any video footage of when Lena disappeared. But again, parents just worried if this could happen to their child. Reporting live, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. All right, Alicia, thank you. Now, over in Medina County, there's another search underway for a man and his family. Investigators say that 40-year-old Jonathan Wright of North Carolina is wanted for sexual exploitation of children and his kids are in danger. Sheriff Randy Brown says that Wright crossed state lines and he believes that he's nearby with the kids. The sheriff says that deputies are searching different buildings and different structures, hoping to find that family. We just got our fingers crossed and praying that someone's going to actually see them and give us a call. We've looked everywhere that we could look where this started, and now we need some something to go look somewhere else. Now, Sheriff Spratt Brown says that they are expanding their search. So if you see right or any of those kids that you see there on the right side of the screen, here's what you can do. You can call two places. One of them is 911. The other place you can call is the Medina County Dispatch Office. The number is right there on your screen. It's 830-741-6153. We now move to a defender's update. A Bear County deputy facing criminal charges for allegedly assaulting a teenager who was in handcuffs. Deputy Abigail Rios was indicted Tuesday on charges of official oppression and assault causing bodily injury. She was taken into custody today. Rios off duty in the early morning hours of New Year's Day 2020 when she's accused of striking the 17 year old victim who was in handcuffs while being investigated for breaking into vehicles in a far northwest side neighborhood. The alleged assault captured on a homeowner's surveillance video. Rios and another off duty deputy identified as Raul Maldonado allegedly witnessed some teenagers breaking into cars chased after them while waiting for a responding deputy. Maldonado listed as a co-defendant. He has not been charged yet, though. Maldonado and Rios both placed on administrative duty after the incident before being served with proposed terminations in July of this year. Both of them currently on unpaid leave. Charges against that teen suspect, by the way, have been dropped. All right, switching gears right now, there is some good news when it comes to the fight against the coronavirus. Today, U.S. health officials authorized the first COVID-19 pill. It's made by Pfizer. Americans are going to be able to take it at home to fight off the worst effects of the virus. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden says that the government is going to be providing 500 million free rapid home testing kits and also increased support for hospitals and redouble vaccination and boosting efforts. 
It was an absolutely beautiful day out there. Tons of sunshine, a cool and crisp morning and a comfortable afternoon. Take a look at some of these temperatures out there from our weather watchers. A little warm in Del Rio, 82 degrees, but 72 in Leon Springs, 75 in Floresville, 70 in Universal City and 74 in New Braunfels. It really does feel more like a spring day than a winter day, but our warm up is just getting started. In fact, coming up in the forecast, we're going to talk about a few things. First of all, you'll notice that there will be morning uh, fog and clouds. Clouds. That'll clear. We'll have sunshine, but then our warm up really starts toastier afternoons and we could potentially have our second or third warmest Christmas ever. Lots to unpack in the forecast. Hey, Sam, how are those holiday travel plans looking out there and roads? <laughs> well, the traffic is not as lovely as the weather, Sarah. This is I-35 southbound at Evans. A couple of lanes uh, blocked there following an earlier uh, crash uh, that we see here. So uh, let's take a wider look at that. So we see the two lanes, you see the emergency vehicles that's causing a major Major delay there uh, on the northeast side coming in 88 minutes, so almost an hour and a half coming out of New Braunfels. A lot of crashes. We'll have it on our Twitter feed. Steve, Stephanie. Thank you, Sam. New at five, foodflation. You've noticed it at the grocery store. Things are more expensive. Yeah, when you get your total, you're like, whoa. Yeah, yeah the question is, how much more expensive are they getting? 12 on your sides, Marilyn Moritz did some digging for us. If you think your cart of groceries is costing more, you're not wrong. I just pay $200 for this. Dee and Philip Heisler say food is eating their budget. Meats. Meats hurt a lot. All major food categories are up, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The Consumer Price Index for food at home rose 6.4 percent, the beefiest annual increase in 13 years. But what about real life? To find out, we dug up grocery receipts from last year and then shopped for those same items this year to compare the prices. We priced 50 foods for curbside pickup at the same Northside HEB, the region's dominant grocer. What did we find? The same groceries that cost $202.37 a year ago now cost $20 more. Ground sirloin is up about 4%. Prime ribeye? It's up nearly 32%. It's costing more to bring home the bacon, too. It's up 11%. And fresh salmon costs 20% more. Food prices may be eating your lunch and breakfast. Raisin Bran Crunch up 4%. Quaker Oats up nearly 10%. And in the produce aisle, a head of iceberg is up 12%. And a bag of mandarin oranges cost 44% more. And don't forget the ice cream. It's up, too. 11 percent. Definitely getting less food for our money everywhere I go. But hang on. We found many prices the same as a year ago. Staples like milk, bread, eggs, orange juice, coffee, chicken thighs, and pork chops. HEB tells us while industry-wide issues continue to impact prices of certain items, HEB works hard to absorb cost increases. Wherever you shop, prices are climbing, and economists expect it to continue well into next year. Finally, one product we checked dropped in price. All the more reason to eat your peas. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. All right, eat your peas. You got that? <laughs> Stick around because there's so much more news for you coming up. You're going to meet the woman behind an organization that is dedicated to helping families enjoy the holiday. And you're also going to meet a family that's benefiting from the We Care Toy Drive. That's up next. This Essay Salute holiday greeting is brought to you by Pam Hospitals. My name is Shannon Marnie. I was deployed as an Army combat medic the same day that my daughter was born on January 6th, 1996. And it makes me feel with my heart how other people feel when they're away from their families on the holidays. And with a heartfelt emotion, I wanted to emphasize to you that we all understand exactly how you feel at this point and that we've got your support and happy holidays and Merry Christmas. I'm Myra Arthur here in the newsroom with a look at what's coming up at 6 o'clock today. In Medina County, deputies were led on a chase after trying to pull over a truck full of people. That truck went off the road, plowing through a fence and fields, and now at least one person is dead. The others inside took off running. These are some still photos of that scene. Our Garrett Berger in Medina County tracking down the latest on what happened, why deputies tried to stop this truck in the first place, and what we know about the people inside. That's what we're working on, putting that story together right now. We'll see you at 6.
All right, Myra, thank you. We are so excited to talk about this, of course, because this yeah. is the meaning of Christmas for the last 20 years. This woman has organized an annual toy drive. Yeah, KSAT photojournalist Robert Samaron introduces us to Cindy Martinez, who started Project We Care 30 years ago. She talks about her motivation for the event and why it is so special. Bringing some of the joy. And there's more coming. Merry Christmas. Kiddos start coming in, Mom? I was one of these kids. And somebody did something similar for my family when I was a little girl, when I was 11. Good luck. And so I know what it's like. Say, so keep it. I was two years old when she started. Uh, she started this this charity project, We Care, to give back. These are all Naomi? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. That person planted a seed, right? That seed has gone on, and we've sponsored three to 4,000. People that don't even know me just jumped in and uh, sponsored two at a time. A miracle, kind of, just to have somebody help out. Every one of them's for you. I didn't know how I was going to do Christmas this year, and now looking at all these presents, I'm like, you know, overjoy. It's truly blessed. Hard not to get excited with them. And then when you see it come together like this, I have a community bond like we're used to. It looks like Santa's workshop in here. Your eyes light up and everything's wonderful again. Look, you guys are famous. Beyond grateful to see the faces of our families. Actually, um, this may be my last year. Can you help me find? I can't do it on my own anymore. It's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, baby. That the biggest lesson is that you don't have to be wealthy to help. Can't believe this is the last time you're doing this. Give from the heart and get other people involved and you can move mountains, right? Cindy, whether this is your last year or not, job well done. Indeed, man. More than 20 years doing this? Wow. But I want to make clear we'd love to follow you next year when you do it too, yes! Cindy. Yes, so. yes. Okay, so now let's turn to this live camera right now. You're looking at uh, Six Flags right now, holiday in the park event that's taking place. Doesn't exactly feel Christmassy, 71 <laughs> degrees right now, but hold on, hold on, because this event, Sarah, is going to continue through January 2nd, so maybe there's time to make it feel more like Christmas. Yeah, maybe, but I'll maybe. be honest with you, looking at the long term, it's going to be pretty warm into the new year, too, but but hey, if you want to celebrate and enjoy some Christmas lights, tonight's your night because temperatures are going to cool off fairly quickly. Let's take a look uh, at how we stacked up for the day today. Another day above average. We got up to 73 degrees this afternoon, 9 degrees above the average high temperature, and our morning low was fairly average, 42 this morning. But take a look at what's going to happen to temperatures over the next few days. We're going to see them go up and up and up past Christmas into the weekend and even beyond next week week, uh, we're still going to be looking at temperatures well above average. By Christmas Day, we're forecasting 83 for the high temperature. If we get up to 83, that'll tie for the second warmest Christmas ever on record for San Antonio. So yeah, we'll talk about why we're going to be warm in a bit. But if you want to enjoy some Christmas lights, uh, you can tonight because temperatures are going to fall into the 50s, 55 degrees by midnight. Clouds and fog will build. And no, there's not going to be snow. But I mean, how many times a year do I get to use these graphics, right? So OK, we are going to have some nice and cool weather tonight. But starting tonight, our humidity is going to rise. Just look at dew points right now. It's bone dry out in Rock Springs, single digit dew points. But down toward Corpus Christi and Victoria, dew points are starting to get to 60 degrees. And watch what happens over the next 12 to 24 hours or so. We see the humidity rise. Now, you may not feel very humid. It may not feel very humid outside tomorrow, but you are going to see the humidity tomorrow in the form of dew and in the form of fog. Now, it's likely that, especially along and east of 35, there's going to be visibility reduced to a half a mile in many places because of the dense fog tomorrow. Now, it is going to eventually dissipate and we'll see afternoon sunshine. But again, clouds and fog in the morning, 55 degrees to start the day. Clearing skies afternoon. So those clouds are going to be stubborn for a little while. We'll see 68 around lunch and then 75 for the high temperature. Again, that's 10 degrees above the average. And it'll be cool in the evening, but not chilly. South winds at 5 to 15. All right, let's take a look at a high pressure system over Baja, California. This is our 
heat high and it's going to be moving overhead a southern Christmas sizzle. If you have travel plans across the nation, Pacific Northwest and areas across the upper Rockies are actually going to be dealing with snow. So that may interrupt some uh, national travel plans. But locally, we're just going to see the thermometer rise with that upper level heat high settling into place. So taking a look at the remainder of the week, Christmas Eve, Friday, cool mornings in the upper 50s, but warm afternoons. 80 on Christmas Eve for the afternoon high, 83 on Christmas Day. We'll be close to that record on Sunday of 83 degrees as well. So, you know, Santa's going to be in shorts and, and sleeves <laughs> as he visits San Antonio. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Santa's going to be sweating it out. Now, you know who won't be the Aggies? Yeah. Yeah, the season is over. And what's so bizarre about this, when you consider how many players are on a college football team at the level Texas A&M has, and you don't have enough players to field for a bowl game, that's how serious this is. When we come back, more about why the Aggies are having to shut down and UTSA falls in Frisco to end their season. Coming up. The fight Texas Aggies football team will not be able to compete in the Tax Slayer Gator Bowl on New Year's Eve against Wake Forest. Head coach Jimbo Fisher announcing today that due to a combination of COVID-19 issues within the AM football program, as well as the season-ending injuries, the Aggies football roster is not in a position to safely participate. That's after practices had to be shut down last Saturday. And with Zach Calzada entering the transfer portal, the Aggies were not even sure who they had left to play at quarterback for the team. The UTSA Roadrunners are still in search of their first ever bowl victory after falling to San Diego State in the Tropical Smoothie Frisco Bowl last night. But they went into that game shorthanded with players in health and safety protocols and without Conference USA's Offensive Player of the Year, Sincere McCormick, one of four UTSA players who opted out of the bowl to prepare for the next step in their careers in pro football. Still, UTSA got off to a great start. Brendan Brady out of Steel High School would get the start at running back with McCormick out. He got the ball rolling with a 27-yard gain to get down to the Aztecs 15-yard line. That set up this. Frank Harris to Dakota. Corian Clark, who makes a nice catch after the defender fell down for the 12-yard touchdown. The Roadrunners, 7-0 lead. With the game tied at 7, they give it to Brady for the 2-yard touchdown. And the Roadrunners are back on top, 14-7, but UTSA would trail 17-14 at the half. That deficit would grow to 14 points until Harris finds Zakari Franklin on the slant. Now UTSA is only down 7 points going into the fourth, but that's as close as UTSA was able to get. They fall 38-24 after being outscored in the second half, 21-10 to finish their incredible record-breaking season. Season 12 and 2. More now from our Larry Ramirez, who was in Frisco for the big game. Thank you very much, Greg. San Diego State scored 17 straight points in the middle of the game to take a 10 point lead on UTSA, and the Roadrunners could never recover. And their awesome season ends in disappointment. You know, I mean, everybody said, you know, we didn't get the job done. Um, gonna watch the film, build on it, and I try to come back next year and uh, you know, win it. Obviously, we're frustrated. Uh, that was a really good football team tonight, and they played really well. Uh, and we're disappointed and um, frustrated and disappointed. That's, that's the best way to describe it. And uh, that's how we feel right now. Coach Trailer put this loss straight on him, saying he needs to coach better. Greg? Back to you. He is certainly a player's coach and he never makes excuses and he always pushes all the credit to the players and accepts all the blame, but still a great season for you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Hope that doesn't take anything away from it, a stellar it, season. It will not. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Right. We'll be right back after this. Well, we've got some major delays on the west side now. 34 minutes, so a half hour from I-10 to 151, only seven minutes the other direction, so you can kind of uh, tell that. This is uh, how that looks on Ooh. the trans guide. A sea of cars, so if you're heading to Ingram Park, watch out for that. The crash on 35, though, the good news, Steve and Stephanie, that appears to be clearing. All right, all right, thank wow, you. Wow, that backup at Ingram, though. <laughs> Big time. Big time. Uh, thank you for watching the news at 5. See you at 6. World News is next.